Big thanks to Ronan, our DJ. Uh, definitely the kind of music that gets you into the right atmosphere to talk a little bit about data and data warehouses. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Atan. I'm a solution architect at Firebolt. Welcome to this webinar with our friends from SimilarWeb. Um, this session will be dedicated to basically explain how SimilarWeb were able to deliver interactive analytics over hundreds of terabytes using Firebolt. Um, we'll walk through how SimilarWeb were able to create this large scale of analytics platform, which collects millions um, data about millions of websites uh, while supporting customers worldwide and maintaining sub-second performance. Um, with us today are Yav Shmarya, which is VP R&D platform in SimilarWeb, and Idan Lahav, which is R&D team leader. Um, they will drive this session and will show you basically how they were able to use Firebolt for the, their use cases. Um, you're welcome to ask questions throughout the session uh, and we'll try to address them and the, at the end of it. All right, so without further ado, Yoav, please take it from here. Hey, so uh, thanks, Matan. Uh, great to be here with you. So I will start with a short introduction um, about our product offering and uh, in general how we um, how our, how our R&D organization is built. Um, so for the next slide. Okay, so um, in in general, similar web is divided into five separate solutions. A solution is basically a use case of our customers. Uh, we divide them into digital research, which is more about benchmarking and comparing uh, yourself uh, to competitors in other markets or discovering other mar markets. Also, uh, digital research is covering the audience analysis, means what actually um, visitors to certain websites or industries are doing, uh, comparing um, to other industries. The digital marketing is the classic use case most of you are probably aware of the seo ppc managers and advertisers uh, we have a fresh new product about e-commerce um, talking specifically about brands and uh, products in amazon uh, we have a great line of investors using our data to predict uh, especially SaaS companies performance and the sales intelligence which allows um, our our sales customers actually uh, to to get leads ideas from our data sets and enrich them with our traffic analytics um, data so um, our r d structure um, is not 
very trivial. We are not just built as many, many teams. We are more of a machine. Uh, we have a pipeline from the data collection to the delivery, which is me and my group. Uh, so quickly, the data collection uh, teams are um, in charge of collecting uh, our most unique data, which is includes contributory network, the partnerships we have all over the world, uh, some direct measurements of um, customers and others that sharing their, their measurement with us, like Google Analytics, and public data that can be scraping, uh, public APIs, etc. Um, then we are cleaning the data, we are processing it um, to avoid uh, some uh, dirty information or private information, so we can give a very, very clear picture um, and then continue to the modeling. This is where the magic basically happens. Let's assume that we can uh, have some view of 1% of the population. So the data modeling part is where we are trying to estimate 100% of internet traffic across the world. Um, and basically the contract with these teams for us is our uh, managed data lake. Um, we are using AWS stack. Um, Idan will, will tell you much more about it. And eventually we are delivering uh, our customers traffic and engagement data uh, which we break down into many, many others capabilities, and I will give you a um, small drill down right now. So uh, this is a very, very, um, you know, trivial view of a similar web. So I, I took godaily.com uh, and we can see the general view of two years of traffic data. Uh, the graph you see here talks about the monthly visits uh, to godaddy.com. A visit is basically when uh, a user is entering this domain, uh, any of these domain pages, landing uh, on godaddy.com. And as you can see, this is um, a view that I would like to understand when analyzing any website, the number of visits, the device distribution. As you can see here, GoDaddy getting most of its traffic from desktop uh, devices and the leading country is United States. Now, the next part, is to uh, being being able to uh, have a deep analysis, and this is very relevant for investors, uh, of the performance of period over period. So here you can see a very clear view that the performance of GoDaddy um, is decreasing uh, in the last year comparing to uh, 2020. Now, most of uh, uh, our customers won't really want to just uh, analyze themselves because they have their own data. Um, I mean, direct measurement tools like Google Analytics. They would like to compare themselves to competitors. So in the next slide, what you will see here is when I comparing GoDaddy to Wix.com. And this is where it becomes interesting because even if the data is not 100% accurate, so our estimations may have some variation, uh, we do see um, and we are insisting on accurate trend. That means that Wix.com starting to get a significant uh, increase of traffic around March and April 2020 when COVID is rising. And we can see that trend is going all over the way until today. And from that point, we are going to the how. Okay, what really happened that we can see this change in the data? What is the tactics of Wix, of GoDaddy? And this is what we call the uh, marketing channels. So as you can see here, we are splitting uh, our traffic into seven different traffic sources. The direct, which means I know how to enter Wix.com or I have it in the favorites. Links from email providers. Uh, referrals is basically any other organic link from other websites. It can be uh, affiliate, it can be Wikipedia and any other website, which is not Wix.com or GoDaddy. Social networks, we, it's basically some kind of referral that we are segmenting as social network, Facebook, Reddit, uh, and all the others. Organic search results, um, not only Google, we are analyzing tens of uh, uh, search engines, also Yandex and Yahoo and Baidu and DuckDuckGo and many more. Paid search are basically search engine uh, ads and display ads. These are the banners that you will see on another website, what we call publisher. And then 
um, we can analyze also trends. So as you can see here, I can see the trend of display ads traffic over time, and I can see that GoDaddy investing a lot, uh, at least compared to Wix.com, in ads and getting a lot of traffic out of it. And the really interesting part is in the breakdown. So we can break each of these channels into, uh, I like to see it as a tree, so to the leaves. Uh, so in the next example, you will see that we are, we are breaking search traffic into keywords. And what you can see here is phrases. It's an aggregating of billions of keywords into a specific phrase. So for instance, you can see that uh, domain is a very strong phrase from uh, for goready.com, but logo is being dominant by Wix.com. And this is where you can start to understand um, the, the differential between the traffic that you can uh, that one get for its website and also the interest of the customers, right? So we understand here that uh, GoDaddy, the, GoDaddy is not a player when you want to build a logo, uh, but is a great player when you want to buy or uh, host your domain comparing to Wix.com. And then we can even drill further to get the actual um, uh, keywords. And this is where SEO managers or PPC or content writer can get a really, really deep understanding uh, of which uh, keyword is gaining traffic to the website. Uh, the traffic, you can we can basically call traffic clicks. It's not just the ranking in Google or any other engine. It's also uh, actually how many people clicked on this result. Um, so this is in a nutshell about similar web and the last part, and this is where Ida is going to talk with you about. Um, so I demonstrated in the next slide that we are uh, having a, a bit of a problem when we have a huge website like Amazon.com and we want to compare it to Foot Locker. Okay, Foot Locker is a very big website, as you can see here, more than 70 million visits per month. But when I try to compare it to Amazon, it's not apples to apples. Um, and one of the issues arise years ago for similar web is what if I want to analyze only the shoes products in Amazon.com? Okay, shoes products is basically thousands or millions of URLs under Amazon.com that talking only about shoes, selling only shoes products. And this is where segment analysis is entering um, to the game. We invested a lot. Uh, in the last couple of years around this solution. Um, and we are serving it successfully in production uh, with Firebolt uh, for the last couple of months. And Dan will share with you more details about it. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, can you see me? No. Hey. Yeah. Um, so hello everyone. Um, my name is uh, Idan. Um, I'm an NRD R&D team leader in SimilarWeb. Um, also a software developer, a backend developer. Um, what we are going to talk about today is uh, uh, our mission. Uh, so basically our mission is to serve a lot of data, big data, uh, to user-facing applications in seconds, meaning uh, mostly web applications, a uh, web application needs a response, a pretty fast response for uh, for about uh, one to two seconds, even less. And uh, our mission is to provide uh, th those applications, those users, with the fastest possible response um, for uh, for the their usage. Um, so let's start uh, with a small uh, introduction of our data. Um, so in general terms, this is uh, how much data we have in production. We have about five terabytes of data each day, um, which entering our, um, our uh, raw databases. Uh, one of our largest data sets, which we'll talk about today, is uh, having uh, one petabyte of uncompressed data and about uh, something about three trillion uh, rows in uh, production, uh, rows of, uh, of tables. And this is an approximation of what we have today in uh, production. Um, so what we have in terms of a uh, pipeline. So we have a data lake, uh, which we use uh, on AWS S3. Um, the data lake stores all of our data. 
And uh, what we do in uh, our group is we take that data, uh, we process it uh, through ETLs, we extract the data from the data lake using Spark and Databricks, which is orchestrated by Airflow. And after we take that data, uh, we load it into a uh, some databases uh, of course uh, we transform the data first um, uh, structured or unstructured uh, to the specific databases also uh, the format is important uh, each database um, we write it we write to it differently uh, so we have for example dynamo db which is a key value document db store um, also Athena for uh, analytics uh, we use also hbase so every feature um, we insert it uh, for every feature we insert it to a different database dependent dependent on the on the use case and from the, those databases we serve to to our users in uh, mostly in web applications uh, apis and stuff like that and um, so what are the challenges uh, in these pipelines uh, so first of all um, pretty basic it's a lot of data uh, a lot of data um, to process uh, it's it's not uh, it, it's a major uh, challenge of course if it was if it was not that much data that it wasn't even a big deal it doesn't matter which way we choose but this is a challenge and um, next details are uh, pretty costly they they um, uh, they take a lot of time. Uh, developers need time to develop them. We have a lot of them uh, because we need to process a lot of data and uh, each uh, data need to be processed differently in order to uh, serve it differently. And also the maintenance, if, uh, if for example, you have, uh, I don't know, if you have something like a, 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 an issue where you need to rerun uh, those ETLs, it also takes time. Uh, so it's also a, a pretty big challenge. Um, also, a big challenge is uh, dynamically calculated data. So um, we have uh, some of our data is pre-calculated, meaning that some of the of the data uh, we know exactly uh, what uh, what the, the data will be. For example, as uh, you have talked about the sites, we have a finite amount of sites. Uh, I don't know millions of sites. Uh, it's pretty easy to calculate for them. Uh, uh, a specific metric and store it in you know, a key value uh, database, maybe DynamoDB, and then uh, it will have millions of rows, maybe uh, four million rows, five million rows, depending on um, uh, for each site uh, how many uh, metrics you wanna you wanna put in. Um, but the issue comes when you need something that is dynamically. It's uh, either a, if a user inputted something like in segments which i will talk later or if uh, you need to um, to serve a combination of sites or even a, a subset of site okay so uh, a subset of sites uh, if you need data for for example for all the combinations of all the sites it takes like uh, two in the power of x or in the power of million which is unfeasible uh, the, it's even more than the, the number of particles in the universe. You can't dynamically calculate all the combinations of all the sites. Um, so this is also a challenge. Um, also, as I said before, we have ETL for every use case because we need to write it differently um, for every use case for each database, uh, depending on the feature. Um, Next, the transform complexity. Okay, so uh, for transforming stuff, you need power, you need computing power, you need Spark, you need Databricks, which is um, which costs money, costs resources. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's not cheap, and um, this is uh, this is our uh, challenges. On the serving uh, layer challenges, uh, we have some challenges regarding Athena and DynamoDB. And we use Athena for serving uh, analytics in production for some features. Uh, it is uh, great for using SQL. It's a, Athena is, a, for, for those who don't know, is a query engine based on Presto. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it can query structured or unstructured data uh, from different sources. And, and uh, it's, uh, it's good, but it's not so good for serving because uh, one particular issue which is uh, um, the performance. So the performance is not good for a serving. It's pretty slow. Uh, you, you can query it from all different ways. 
uh, query all types of da data, uh, but it's just too, too slow. Uh, we use it for some features though. And the other thing is DynamoDB, okay? DynamoDB is uh, basically the opposite, if you can think of it that way. Um, it's super fast. It's one of the fastest uh, databases, but it's um, it doesn't support any querying, any um, a grouping, uh, aggregating, any complex uh, querying on it. Uh, it it's just a document store, a key value store. It's pretty. It's great for pre-calculated data where you know what the key that you're trying to find and what, or what the keys are, and then you can retrieve it. But for dynamically uh, uh, queries or dy dynamic queries or for stuff that uh, queries that are um, dependent on the user entering uh, some kind of input, it doesn't work that well because you can't do any SQL queries, any grouping, any uh, complex queries on other fields. Um, it's just basically a, a document store. And also the cost, uh, DynamoDB, we write a lot of data, as I said, DynamoDB is uh, pretty expensive when it costs, when it, uh, in writes, because we write a lot of data, so we need to increase our capacity for writes each time we want to write something for uh, DynamoDB. And uh, this costs a lot of money. Uh, also, Athena, we, we pay per request, and uh, when the requests are uh, large, then it also costs a uh, pretty, pretty hefty fine for, uh, for our databases. Um, so um, now I'm going to talk about, uh, after the, the introduction about segment analysis. So segment analysis is one of, uh, I think the most interesting and the most challenging uh, features in all similar web. Uh, the, what, what makes it the most challenging is the dynam dynamic nature of the calculation and the super complex a query we need to run in order to get uh, the data for segment analysis. So uh, before I talk about segment analysis, I'm going to recap what you have said. So um, as, as you have mentioned, uh, we have website analysis where we can see for, uh, for a site, for a specific site, for a specific country, and for a specific uh, date range, uh, some metrics on, on the site like visits, um, how many how many visits does the site get in, on average in a month? Um, how many users enter this uh, this site? Uh, unique users, uh, visit duration, and a lot of other metrics on on specific sites. Um, segment analysis is uh, is this we want the same metrics, but on a part of sites, not on the entire site. Uh, so, for example, uh, let me take Amazon. Okay, and uh, Amazon.com, the domain, and uh, the term PS5, okay? So we want uh, not to get all the visits and all the metrics for Amazon.com in USA. We only want those that are relevant for PS5, okay? Uh, we want to segment that site. Um, we're interested in only PS5 in Amazon.com. Um, so this is the, the end result of what we get if we if you see on top here, it's Amazon in, uh, it's PS5 on Amazon. It's pretty small, but I think you can see it. So, um, so as you can see here, it's uh, pretty in interesting. On September, uh, on September of this year, um, I think, uh, no, I think last year, um, uh, there was a spike in uh, visits for specifically for PS5 on Amazon.com because it was, um, uh, the, the PS5 was just uh, uh, declared, okay? So um, the declaration made, made a spike for those visits uh, in this segment in amazon.com. And as you can see in November, when it was first uh, launched on pre-sale on the pre-orders in Amazon, we, we see a huge spike again in November, mid-November, I think it was. And then the, the regular uh, uh, flow of the views. Uh, so this is a, a, an example of a segment. Um, and uh, let's take a look at the data and let's take a look at how do we do, how do we do it? Because as I said, um, uh, for uh, PS5 is just one word, okay? Uh, the user can enter any word, it can, can enter any combination of terms. 
uh, we can't pre-calculate all the combination the user can think of. So we need to find a way um, to actually scan our data and, and find uh, and calculate those visits, those, uh, those numbers. So we have a huge data set, which uh, has over one petabyte of uncompressed data. Um, so uh, it, this database has, has some rows um, and columns, of course, and uh, each row has URLs and timestamps array, okay? So each row is, is a session. And uh, what basically we need to do is to match a specific pattern. For example, in this, in this uh, example, you have uh, an array of URLs for each uh, session. And we want, uh, we want only those with the word executives. So we want the, the query to return only uh, the, the last two rows and not the top one, okay? And also on top of that, we, have, uh, we need to do a calculation. After we find those URLs, we need to calculate using the timestamp how, how much time, uh, uh, how much time uh, was between two timestamps and a lot of other very complex calculations. But uh, the, the big issue is that we scan a lot, a lot of data. For example, for one day in amazon.com in USA, it's about 150 gigabytes, uh, a lot, a lot of rows only for one day, okay? And uh, our queries run for six months, two years, three years. Um, so it's a lot of data to scan. Um, uh, just to to uh, to make things clear, 80% of the data is pages. So what you see here, it could be a very very long array, and we have a lot of columns in this data set. But uh, the pages uh, accounts for 80% of the entire data set. So this is a pretty big uh, challenge to actually process this data live and return the results to the users in seconds. And um, so let's see what, what is our proposed solution um, if we look at the, the stack we had or we have now. Like, uh, let's take a look at Athena and DynamoDB. So uh, as I said, Athena, uh, you can query, uh, you can query even, uh, even arrays, you can search inside arrays, but it's pretty slow. Uh, also, uh, array calculation or array manipulation is super slow in, uh, on Athena. Uh, it, it's not really feasible to do it in Athena. Uh, you can query it from different ways, but it just looks slow. And um, again, what we said about DynamoDB, if you remember that it's, um, it's static. I mean, uh, you, you can't save uh, data for all the combinations of words that people can use uh, on Amazon or on any other website. It's, uh, it's uh, infinity, you can't, you can't do it. Um, uh, so you can store it in Dynamo, and also Dynamo is a key value store. Um, uh, you, all, you, only, you can all, only do get there, like get a value from a key specifically. Uh, you can do like very complex queries. You can do SQL or stuff like that. And this is what we need in, in, in segments. Um, so, okay, so how can we support um, dynamically every segment the user can think of. You can, you can think of what he wants. We can do it offline, by the way, with Spark, but we, we want to, to, to make it work uh, seamlessly in a web application. Um, so uh, this is the first phase of uh, what our solution used to be like. Um, so what we did is uh, um, uh, we did uh, uh, we had the AWS Lambda functions. Uh, AWS Lambda is just a function. Uh, it's like a, a little computer which goes up, it's ser serverless. It goes up, calculates uh, uh, some function and then returns and that's it. Um, you can have auto scaling Lambda, which means that um, what we did is that if you, for example, want uh, data for a specific segment uh, for amazon.com uh, for six months, then each Lambda will take one day out of those six months, meaning 152 days. It will be 152 Lambdas and every Lambda will take a specific uh, file 
a specific file uh, in JSON format. I'll explain about it a bit later. Um, and those formats we write on S3 because we need it and, and we need to write it again. Uh, so each Lambda takes uh, care of exactly one uh, day, uh, calculates uh, what we say, the, the search inside the page's URL for the PS5, then they do some aggregation, uh, in, literally in the code, and then all those lambdas return to a centralized location. And in memory, we just aggregate the numbers and return it to the users. Um, so uh, this is basically this basically works, but um, we have some issues with it. So um, we need to write uh, the data again so that and the lambda can read it efficiently. Okay. Uh, it's pretty prob problematic. Um, so what we did is we had an ETL uh, using Spark, which takes from the data lake using Airflow from the from our data lake, extracts the, the data in ORC format, which we have today in uh, production and stores it in uh, S S3 again, just in a JSON format. So, um, we did it because um, this is the only way the AWS Lambda can read the file textually using streams and uh, process the, the uh, each Lambda processes one day, as I said, uh, row by row uh, uh, and uh, returns the, the value. But we have this process in order to rewrite the data in a specific way for the Lambda to read. Um, so what's the issue here? Um, solution that should work and it's pretty, uh, the lambdas are uh, working parallel. You can increase the number of lambdas. If you do two years, it will be 720 lambdas. And um, what's the issue? So we can't support all sites. What, what does that mean? It means that um, we don't want to rewrite the entire petabyte of data again in a JSON format. It's just a waste uh, because not every site in the world gets uh, analyzed in segments. Uh, it's just a waste, like 80% of the data will not be used. So in order to support it, uh, each time uh, uh, there was a request for a site to be supported in segments, we, we, we ran the same, uh, uh, the same ETL that I, we saw before in order to write it in JSON format. And this takes a lot of time, a lot of money to rewrite uh, the entire history of that site uh, in, uh, uh, just for the segments, uh, just in JSON format and in specific partitions in S3. Uh, it's, it costs a lot of money and it's a very heavy processes, process which prone to, prone to a, lot of, uh, a lot of failures. Um, second thing is performance. Um, as I said before, uh, each Lambda takes one day, but some days are uh, take slower than others. They have more files maybe. Uh, so the slowest Lambda needs to wait for uh, the other Lambda, for the, the other Lambdas needs to wait for the slowest Lambda because uh, in the end we need to aggregate all the, all the days. And uh, this is causes performance issues. And of course it's not uh, that efficient. Um, also, we could do like uh, each Lambda could take one file, but then you get to hundreds and thousands of Lambdas, which is not feasible. Uh, another thing is basically data redundancy. We write the same data that we have, again, just for the, the AWS Lambda to read it. Um, pretty wasteful. Uh, price, uh, okay, it's uh, self-evident. If you have Spark, if you need jobs to write it, if you have uh, a lot of Lambda, which we pay per millisecond, uh, it costs money and uh, that's it. And um, another thing is the, the most basic, basic thing, the most uh, um, uh, important thing is we can support uh, any other queries, any other grouping and aggregation on, on different fields from different directions. We can only support uh, uh, calculating the segments as is. Uh, we, we can support another thing on that data. The data is written in JSON format specifically for the Lambda to read. Um, so those are the issues uh, that we faced. Um, um, so 
uh, ah, another thing uh, also I forgot, we can support uh, worldwide, okay? So uh, we do calculations per, uh, per country, per, per site, per date, um, but in order to support for this feature uh, worldwide, we need to aggregate all the data from all the, the countries, which is not feasible in AWS Lambda. It will take uh, much more than uh, thousands of Lambda uh, uh, every time you need to uh, process worldwide, because if you multiply, multiply the number of, of, uh, of uh, countries and the number of, uh, of uh, date ranges and days, you will get a huge number. Um, so um, we turn to Firebolt. Um, so why Firebolt? Um, this is pretty much uh, uh, sums it up. Um, we did a POC with Firebolt about, I think, a year ago, um, a year and a half maybe. And um, what we saw is that uh, we compared it to Athena, to BigQuery. Um, and for example, let's take a look uh, for large sites, meaning like uh, sites which have a lot of data in our uh, database, in our table, the, the table we saw. So for, uh, for a single country, uh, USA, the largest country, uh, for one month, the, the query returns in one to two seconds, even less. Um, for larger, uh, for worldwide, for example, it can return in six seconds. But uh, in all of those uh, scenarios, uh, Athena was the worst. BigQuery uh, was uh, next, and but but Firebolt pretty much had the best performance out of all the three of them. And um, there's also some other uh, pros. Uh, performance, I talked about it. It's a major latency improvement compared to BigQuery and Athena. Um, another important thing is uh, an ELT process of working. Uh, we actually don't need uh, any data transformation or processing. Uh, we just uh, get the data and just uh, running just where you enter the data into Firebolt and just query the data from all different aspects and all different ways. Um, so we don't need any additional data transformation. Um, uh, as we've seen before. Uh, also, one, uh, one more important thing is it's dynamic. Like you can support many features on the same data set. Uh, just you can have different engines. Uh, you have uh, computing storage uh, decoupling. So uh, if you need to uh, support, uh, like in segments, we support also, also a lot of other features on the same data. Uh, so we don't need to rewrite this data. Uh, we can support it on the same data set. And it's this. It basically supports also ORC files and packets. So we basically just uh, we use the same data as in production in our data lake. We don't process it again uh, at, uh, with the with our data lake. Um, so this is how it is in production now. So uh, the entire thing uh, that you saw earlier with the with the Lambda AWS Lambda and S3 is just the Firebolt engine. Uh, pretty much does the same thing. Uh, Query is a Firebolt engine using uh, using our code, uh, .NET, using a client, um, using a Firebolt uh, REST API. Uh, queries the data, gets the data, does some other calculations, which it did before. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that, but some pretty simple calculations and returns the data to the user. So uh, all those AWS numbers are uh, replaced by Firebolt engine. And the ingestion part, uh, remember when we had here like a Spark job uh, with Databricks, so that is gone. And we use, uh, we just insert, we just load the data from the data lake uh, um, straight to uh, Firebolt uh, uh, using the uh, Airflow as a task uh, orchestrator. Um, and that's it. So um, let's take a look at the, at the production flow. What do we do? So um, first, uh, let's see the ingestion process in Airflow. So uh, before ingest, we have um, we have a sensor. We have a data lake sensor which tells us if a partition is available for ingestion, like in our data lake. So. Um, 
when the when the in, when the data lake sensor is activated, we start by using a task for starting the engine. We start the engine, wait for the engine to to um, to start. After that, we drop partition. Uh, we drop it because we moved because we don't want uh, a reruns of this DAG to uh, uh, duplicate the data. So we want to start with a clean slate. So we drop the partition. Then we start just an ingest query. Um, and for specifically for segments, uh, the ingest query doesn't include any transformation or any, any stuff, it's just uh, ingest. Uh, you just take the data as is from our data lake to a uh, Firebolt. Uh, we test the data, we test the, the data in Firebolt, what we ingested is the same as the source data. Uh, we warm up uh, the engine, it needs to warm up. Um, and then uh, at the last post ingest phase, we stop the engine because the ingestion has finished. Um, so what are the Firebolt features that we actually use? Um, so we use the REST API, the client, uh, this is, a major thing for us, we, we query the analytic engine programmatically, programmatically through our code in the .NET services. So um, uh, it, it's web services that query uh, the Firebolt engine uh, uh, in REST uh, API. And um, also uh, warm up. Okay, so um, only ranges, only only specific uh, data ranges like sites, dates, and stuff like that that are uh, most uh, recently used will be in the cache, okay? So uh, when it's in the cache, in the storage of the Firebolt engine, it will be uh, the fastest uh, uh, query time. So uh, in order to save uh, money and save uh, storage, uh, it's pretty common that we, we only need to use, we only uh, need to use the most recently uh, used ranges. Uh, other ranges, uh, can still be in S3, uh, but um, they will uh, be brought back to the storage if uh, they will be mostly used. So it's, it's a feature that uh, we use a lot. Um, uh, decoupled compute, okay, we have a separate engine, for example, for another, for another product we have, for example, the API product we have, um, which is a separated engine. Uh, it does the same queries, does the same uh, stuff, but it's a different engine in order to, uh, uh, to use the different loads. It can be an engine with uh, different uh, specs. Uh, also, we use the same engine for other features on the same data, as I said before. Um, this is just a screenshot of the, this, what I said, the engine analytics API, which we have in production, and also an engine, uh, a regular engine for uh, the, web, um, the web applications. Um, so uh, monitoring, how do we monitor stuff? Um, so basically uh, we use Datadog, we have this dashboard, uh, which you can filter by engine, by database and by application. And uh, you can see here uh, the, the success rate, the su success, we, we actually, um, we actually uh, report those metrics to Datadog. Uh, you can see the response time, the, the success failures and success rate. And uh, this is how we uh, monitor. We also um, monitor uh, the engine's health. Uh, we have alerts when the engine has too many failures, uh, when data is invalid, when latency is too high. Uh, we do much more than that. Uh, it's just uh, to make sure that our production is healthy and uh, that nothing uh, goes wrong. Um, so, um, that's about it, but uh, the key takeaway uh, from it, um, if you take one thing is uh, what I've shown is how to serve uh, large amounts of data uh, in real time online dynamically um, with high performance, very cost effective because we use the same, uh, the same data for many other features. Um, we compute the compute and storage are decoupled, uh, meaning we can have uh, many other uh, um, many other uh, uh, engines uh, for uh, uh, for even data science or other parts of our um, of our company that wants to use that data and query that data, 
and basically we serve online very pretty fast, very high performance, very complex queries uh, in pretty much uh, uh, seconds. Um, and uh, that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Um, one last thing, uh, of course, um, we're hiring. Uh, so if you want a challenge, if you want a great challenge, we're hiring for infrastructure, for data teams, for uh, backend developers. Uh, so if you really want a challenge and you will really want to uh, to be on the frontier of uh, data exploration, hit me up, hit you have up. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, Idan, for this awesome presentation. I can uh, say um, that I fully agree. Uh, similar web uh, are such on the frontier in terms of uh, being a data-driven company. Um, so I couldn't agree more. Um, all right. So with that awesome presentation, uh, with Adam walking us through basically um, how similar web are able to utilize Firebolt for their use cases, we just wanted to take a few more minutes to discuss a little bit uh, the background of Firebolt, a little bit about the solution and then take some time to answer some of the questions that we got before and throughout the webinar. So let me share my screen. All right, so let's start with just a few slides about Firebolt, uh, what we do and where we come from. So a little bit about the position of Firebolt within the market of the cloud data warehouses. So Firebolt has a fairly new data warehouse is built actually on top of the all the great advancements that were done in the recent years in the area of the data warehouses. Um, that includes obviously all the principles of separation of storage and compute, um, ease of use, um, the ability to support very large scale terabytes and petabytes of data, and obviously our bread and butter, which is performance over scale. So what are our differentiators, what makes us so unique? Uh, number one, which is our claim to fame, uh, is that we are faster than anything else. Um, it doesn't really matter if it's a traditional BI or customer facing or ELT, we will always aim to be um, as fast as there. there's any solution that can provide uh, performance out there. Um, our unique architecture is built especially for that. Um, so this is the one thing that is essentially our bread and butter. Number two is that Firebolt is actually built mainly for data engineers as developers. We see the future of data actually more coupled with um, software engineering rather than a traditional BI and dashboarding. Uh, we see data being controlled, tested, and versioned rather than being just um, queried through external tools. And as such, we believe that uh, data developers will play a huge role in the future of data. So we uh, have essentially created a product that is supposed to be a great tool for them, both in terms of efficiency, uh, performance, and ease of use. Lastly, Firebolt is built for all analytical workload, um, traditional BI, ad hoc querying, data science, um, customer facing, ELT, whatever it is, we have the flexibility in order to support it and provide the maximal efficiency in order to maximize performance, essentially. A few words about our architecture, just a quick overview. So as explained earlier, Firebolt is built with the basic principle of separation between storage and compute. So essentially you get a full separation of your data lack or uh, storage layer between and the compute engines. Um, Firebolt is actually uh, able to consume data through external files using SQL, whether it's Parquet files or JSON or Avro or CSV. Um, this data is being stored, ingested into Firebolt Data Warehouse and stored within a um, unique file type called FFF. 
um, which has a unique set of settings, including um, compression and encoding. Every triple F file is coupled with the sparse index, which really enables Firebolt later on when queries are executed, um, what we call extreme pruning, um, and basically to scan as less data as possible in order to optimize the queries. Um, the compute engine itself and the architecture of the query engine is built to fully utilize all the resources that exist within the engine, SSD, RAM, and CPU, and basically to optimize queries on the fly in order to ensure the best performance. Just a little bit background about Firebolt as a company. Um, so we have really great leaders um, and world-class uh, talents. Um, just as an example, our general manager in the United States is from Looker, City are from BigQuery, our founders are from SciSense, and our VP Solutions is from Imply. Uh, we've raised uh, $164 million in round A and B. Uh, from great VCs, and we already have multiple large-scale um, customers in production with Firebolt, including similar web. Um, so before we wrap up, I'd just like to take a few more minutes to uh, answer some questions. So let me stop sharing and get the questions that we have gathered so far. All right, so we have a few questions here I see. Uh, looks like most of them are addressed to Firebolt and we have one for similar web. So let me tackle them one by one. Um, first question uh, about Firebolt's integration with analytics and data science platform. That's a, that's a fantastic question. Um, as I explained earlier, Firebolt is designed to be basically um, uh, a data warehouse that can support any analytical workload, including external BI tools um, and data science um, integrations. Uh, currently, we support uh, tools like uh, Looker, Tableau, Metabase, and others. And in terms of data science, you have the full ability to query your data and access it programmatically using Python, APIs, JDBC. Um, so we've done. Uh, a great path so far, but we have a long way to go and our integration team is working on it on a daily basis. Um, next question, is Firebolt better than BigQuery? Um, that's a great question. Um, I think the short answer is um, yes. It really depends on the use case, but uh, I think that for most of them, the answer is yes. Um, one thing I can say with confidence is that what we're seeing with prospects coming over from BigQuery is that when it comes to the ability to deliver consistent performance over really large scales of data without um, you know, paying too much for it in the serverless paper query that uh, BigQuery has, um, we really see um, Firebolt outshines a solution like BigQuery. Um, we have a question here for similar web. So, uh, Yoav, if you can take it. Um, um, I've been asked about cost comparison between Firebolt as a solution and alternative uh, or previous solutions that you guys have used in the past. Yeah, so f first of all, uh, for our production use cases, and we are also uh, um, sticking to multi-region solutions. So we have multiple clusters for, for every feature. Uh, it's very important to us to have a 24 uh, seven hours um, running engine, running clusters that can serve analytics. And for that reason, uh, paper query is not an optimal way for us to, um, to, to pay for, for databases. Uh, so this is for general data warehousing um, and some, you know, uh, unlimited flexible solutions. Um, in terms of uh, disk-based databases, we had multiple um, POCs also with Elasticsearch. And we we uh, also writing a lot of data to DynamoDB. Because that in our use case, we are writing um, huge batches of data daily or monthly. 
So writing into key value stores can take a lot of time, very error prone and very, very costly. Okay, for example, DynamoDB writing um, is very expensive. Um, and the, 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 the main thing with Firebolt is that first of all, you can control the exact node type that you're using in EC2. Um, and we see, uh, you know, dramatic performance with very, uh, let's call it simple nodes are uh, not, not only CPU incentive, uh, very modest uh, nodes can give us uh, great results. And for that reason, we can really ask to work only with very specific type of machines uh, and control the costs. What we cannot do with, you know, solutions like Snowflake when you can select between small and super extra large clusters. Uh, yeah, makes complete sense. Uh, thank you, Yoav for this detailed answer. Um, next one, how can we get our hands on a trial account? Uh, well, you came to the right place. Um, you're welcome to, um, to leave your email, reach out to us. Uh, POC process in Firebolt actually starts with what we call a Firebolt Bench POC. Uh, we essentially take care of the initial implementation and only once we deliver um, a reliable uh, proof of concept, show you the results. Um, you can start a trial account and basically test it on your own. Uh, next one is SQL supported. Um, yes, uh, Firebolt is completely SQL based data warehouse. Um, ANSI SQL based on Postgres uh, syntax actually. Um, not only SQL supported, uh, we actually unlocked some really cool programmatic um, uh, features that are normally uh, only part of other programmatic languages, including uh, Lambda functions and full support of array, arrays and JSON processing. By the way, Matan, I just want to add that um, the use case Idan mentioned about the segments, so we have a crazy array manipulation there. Uh, this is one of the main strengths of Firewall for us. Um, we also made a lot of comparison, you know, between uh, even uh, having unique values. Uh, we saw a, a dramatic increase in performance when um, doing it, when manipulating arrays, comparing to the old SQL way. Definitely, definitely. It's, uh, I completely agree that the ability to process semi-structured data within the data warehouse, within using SQL, is such a game changer. Um, thank you for that note. Next one, does Firebolt have materialized view? Um, so not materialized views, we're actually taking a lot of pride in our ability to deliver uh, really fast performance without the need to you know, materialize result sets. Uh, we do have some sort of a concept of materialized view uh, that is called um, aggregated index. Uh, it's not materialized view per se because uh, rather than holding the result set, it really holds the aggregation, um, some aggregation definition in a pre-aggregated um, binary state. That is important to really support, um, you know, incremental changes rather than need to recreate the, the object. But essentially it's really good to optimize aggregation queries. Uh, last but not least, will this uh, session be recorded? Yes, it is. Uh, will be recorded and you will be able to find it uh, on our website, or I guess it will be sent to you over email. Um, that's it in terms of questions that we have got. Um, so at this point, I'd like to thank um, our guests uh, from Similar Web. You are already done. Thank you so much for taking your time walk us through your use case. And uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, we'll see you in the next webinar. Bye-bye.